May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. So God says through Jeremiah, his prophet. And if you read it in the context of the rest of Jeremiah, it is a very remarkable statement. Throughout the book of Jeremiah, God says that he is delivering his faithless people into the hands of their enemies so that faithfulness to God requires that one submit to judgment and bondage under Babylon. That's essentially Jeremiah's message. God is coming to judge his people, and he's going to deliver them into the hands of their enemies. If you remember, that's why Jeremiah is always in trouble, right? Is because he's saying that over and over again. He is seen as unpatriotic because he keeps telling people to stop resisting the pagan conquerors because this is God's will. And all the false prophets are saying, no, 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 of course that can't possibly be the case. God's people have become so corrupt, immoral, and shameless that he raises up the pagans in order to chastise them. False prophets are running amok, telling the people they have nothing to fear, that God will deliver them as he has in the past. The priests adulterate the worship of the Lord with pagan rites and immorality. The political leaders lap up the pablum of these sycophants to feed their own egos, even as God's judgment marches up from Babylon to overtake them. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. And they persecute the true prophet, Jeremiah, because he gives them, gives them God's word straight. Isn't it amazing how the human condition doesn't change? And yet, in the midst of all of this, God says that this same family of rulers, the line of David, will produce a righteous king, just and wise, who will reign over his people, providing safety and security and redemption. Now jump forward about 600 years. Remember, our country has existed less than 300 years. Right? We're jumping forward 600 years. And the righteous branch of David is hanging on a cross outside of Jerusalem. He is being executed in the manner of a slave. He is bleeding where the nails have traumatized his hands and his feet, where he's been flogged, where the thorns have pierced his head, and he struggles periodically to get his breath by pulling against the nails in his hands to relieve the pressure on his lungs. That's Jeremiah's righteous branch of David. This is not our normal picture of a king because this is not a normal king. A good king does justice to the best of his ability, but the perfect king, the perfect king must do justice perfectly. And so this perfect king, this king of kings, our king, finds himself not appearing as a king at all. Instead, he looks like that. The difficulty is not that he is less than a king, although that's how he appears. The difficulty is that he is more than a king. For Jesus to merely claim the Davidic kingship would actually be extreme humility. You may remember that he never actually does that. People call him that. People call him son of David, right? But he doesn't. He fulfills the prophecies. 
He enters Jerusalem on the donkey. He never denies that he is the king, but his actual claims for himself are of a much higher order. Like before Abraham was, I am. In Colossians, St. Paul tells us that he is not merely a son of God, as King David was, but he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn. As St. Paul would have it, the person hanging there, bleeding on Good Friday, was the source of all things and the agent of creation. And not just the creation of earthly things. In him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And then he goes on to name spiritual, angelic beings of various orders, thrones, dominions, principalities, authorities. The point here is the same as St. John's. Without him was not anything made. He was before all created things. Now this is all very well, and we've heard it before. The word of God was the agent of creation. Okay. But St. Paul is actually saying more than that here. It's difficult even to get our minds around this. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Jesus is not merely the agent of our creation, he is also the source of all being and holds everything in its place by force of his divine will. And he is also our destination, our destiny. All of creation is on a trajectory from our creation to our reunion with Christ, in which We never are bereft of his enveloping presence. It is in him that all things consist, hold together, have their being. And yet that same person in whom all things already existed before all things... You see... He is not part of that creation. He exists eternally. And his particularity is never overridden by his creation. It's pantheists like to say that God is in everything, right? That's not the point. The point is that everything is in God. And yet God is beyond everything else. All things may hold together in him, but he himself may also be communing with his father or laughing over dinner with his friends or hanging there bleeding and suffering on the cross. As I say, this is not our normal picture of a king. Trying to conceptualize such a person leaves the mind spinning. He is just too big. And then there's more. We've we've talked about who he is in his being, but now he acts. For in him was pleased to dwell this entire fullness, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, making peace by the blood of his cross. So this perfect king, who is much more than a mere king, provides perfect justice and peace. Not the kind of provisional earthly justice of which we normally think. He provides perfect justice. And by that perfect justice, he brings reconciliation, peace, the restoration of our relationship with God and with each other. Now, 
who do we think we are in the story of the crucifixion? At best, we think of ourselves as the crowd of people who stood by, watching. At worst, we think that we have the ability and the prerogative to critique the king, like the first thief on the cross. Come on, if you're, if you're the king, do something. Fix it. What we really are is the crucified thieves. We don't normally really think about it, but that's the way it is. We are the ones who are rightly condemned for our own actions. In order to provide perfect justice, the king must deal with my crimes and yours. Not just the sin of those other people who we think deserve to be dealt with. Ours. And that is why we find him looking so distinctly unroyal, in order to give us perfect justice and perfect peace. He has taken our punishment on himself. That is what he is doing, hanging there, bleeding and dying on the cross. That is the crowning perfection of his true royalty. How do we respond to this perfect king who takes on our slavery in order to bring us justice and peace together? This more than king who becomes like us so that we can become like him. Well, the two thieves give us two models to follow. Like the first thief, we can commit the blasphemy of expecting Jesus to immediately remove our present pain. And you say, God, I'm hurting. Where are you? What are you doing about it? It's tempting. I've been there. I'm sure you have. We are such small creatures, and the anguish is real. We cannot usually see beyond our present agonies. And we certainly cannot comprehend the magnitude of Jesus in his being or in his actions. It is easier to say, what have you done for me lately, your majesty? But when I'm done with my latest tantrum, and there are many, I try to return to the path of the second thief. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The second thief sees the broken body of the king and recognizes in it his own brokenness. The one in whom all things hold together hangs there providing a way out of this mess that I have created. I am receiving the due reward of my deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. By his constant working, the Lord and master of all things holds me in existence in spite of myself until the time when I find myself fully in him. If we are willing to enter into this penitence expressed by the second thief, then the promise of paradise is for us. And the pleasure of true life in, through, and with the King of kings and the Lord of lords will never fail. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.